Follow along Matthew 19, beginning in verse 27. <clears throat> then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit on his glorious, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or farms for my name's sake, will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Let's pray. Father, the prophet Isaiah said that just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so too your ways are higher than our, our ways. And your thoughts are not our thoughts. And Father, we pray in these next moments as we consider your ways, as we consider your thoughts, we pray that they would become our thoughts. We pray, Father, that we would not mold you into our image, but we pray that we would be shaped into your image and that we would think of these matters of grace and mercy as you define them and not merely as we define them. Father, we thank you for this teaching from our Lord. We pray now, Lord, that we would give ourselves not only to faith and obedience, but to appreciate this great mystery that he teaches us of. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At some point in life, we all ask the question, so what's in it for me? There are many times in life when we find ourselves asking that question. Before we get our hands dirty, before we raise our hand to sign up, before we get involved in some project, some effort, we first want to know what's in it for me. Sometimes we ask that question for the right reasons, sometimes for the wrong reasons, but eventually we will all ask it. At a certain age, I have discovered that children become particularly adept at asking this question. My wife and I have laughed about the fact that we feel like our two oldest boys are going to grow up to be very skillful hostage negotiators by the time they become adults. Right now, what they're holding hostage is their obedience, you know, more often than not. We'll say, hey guys, go, go clean your room, and it's like they pull out an imaginary bullhorn all right, parents, listen up. This is how this is going to go down. You want us to clean our room in exchange? We want two slices of cheese on our grilled cheese from now on. Do you understand? <laughs> this is how it's going to work. I just tell them we live in America, and here in America, we don't negotiate with terrorists, right? So, <laughs> story over with. One of my sons did ask me one time, I said, go get my shoes for me so we can go out. And he says, are you going to give me something for it? <laughs> and I said, you ask that question again and I will give you something for it. <laughs> but even children, they learn to ask this question. Hey, what's, what's in it for me? Do I get something out of this? You know, sometimes though, that's a wise question to ask. It's not just motivated out of selfishness. I imagine that somewhere this week there will be some investor, some gray-haired guy in an Italian suit sitting in a private dining room, listening to a couple of nervous entrepreneurs pitch their greatest business idea. And as he sits there and politely 
chews his spinach salad and quietly drinks his water, he thinks to himself, all right, guys, let's get to the bottom line. What's in it for me? Before I give you this money, before I invest in your company and your idea, let's get to the bottom. And that's wise. It's prudent to ask that. Children ask it, investors ask it, and frankly, all of us ask it. But it still is a little bit surprising, I think, to discover in our text this morning that here we find the disciples asking this question. In verse 27, notice how our passage begins. Then Peter said to him, that is Jesus, Behold. In other words, Jesus, come here a second, look here, I've got something I want to ask you. Behold, we have left everything and followed you, what then will there be for us? What's in it for us, Jesus? If you write in your Bible, by the way, underline the little word we, it's emphatic. He's clearly talking about we, the twelve. He looks around and sees the eleven behind him, this sort of motley crew of tax collectors and fishermen and these guys that are just sort of the, in some ways, blue-collar workers. And he says, hey, what about this group? We have left everything. Now, his question here, you will remember, it's in response or in reaction to what has just happened in the passage. Do you remember what happened last Sunday? The rich young ruler approached Jesus and said, Jesus, I would like eternal life. How do I obtain it? And Jesus tells the man to repent of his sin, of materialism, and instead to come follow Jesus. And so Jesus makes that clear to him, and what happens? The man walks away sad because he owned a lot of property, and he wasn't willing to repent of his materialism. And so now, seeing that, this, this man, this rich young ruler, who, who, who held on to everything, he walked away with nothing. And so now we have the disciples who, looking at this, say, but wait a minute. We, in contrast to that guy, we held on to nothing. We have given up everything. We did what he was not willing to do. So Jesus, what's, what's in it for us? Now, we don't know exactly Peter's motivation. That, that's one of the drawbacks of the written text you know it's like getting a text message or an email you can't always hear the tone of voice or if there's sarcasm involved you know it's it's difficult to pick up on that so we don't know if he's asking this question as a greedy little child you know what am I going to get out of this or just a, a, a wise investor trying to see what's on the other side of this it, it seems to be more the latter because Jesus's answer here is is very reassuring they say, Jesus, what's in this for us? We, we've labored, we have toiled for a long time. Now we've given up a lot. What's, what's going to be out there for us? You know, I think some of us even think that, ask that question, don't we? I mean, we may not ask it out loud, but let's be honest. Many of us, we've been Christians for years and years, maybe decades and decades, and we have given up our Sundays to come to church, times of prayer, times to do this, times of service to go on missions trip. We've given up our money. We, we've prioritized the Lord as we should, and we think about that day, and we think, well, the Bible speaks of rewards. I wonder what mine will be. And that's what Peter's asking. And so Jesus replies to him in verse 28, Truly I say to you. By the way, anytime you come across that phrase, that's Jesus' authoritative signature. It's like the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. Truly I say to you. He's either going to clarify old revelation or he's about to give new revelation. And so he's about to reveal something that they did not know about the end times. He says, truly I say to you that you who have followed me, you the twelve, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones. Now, my version here, the NASB, it uses the word in the regeneration. That's really accurate, but really clunky. <laughs> it's a weird word to use, regeneration. Other translations that you may have say in the, the, in the um, new age, in the new era, uh, in the rebirth or something like that. 
it speaks, we think of regeneration as, as a person being born again, right? They're, they're lost, and now they're, they're born again. He's saying here, this is not about a person being born again. He's talking about time and the, the universe. He says there's coming a day when the universe will be regenerated. It will be born again. We call this the new heavens and the new earth. So Jesus here looks down the long corridor of history and he looks way off into the distance and says, in the new heavens, in the new earth, when the, when the dust of this world and this time has settled, here's what's going to happen. In that time, he says there, when I'm seated upon my throne, you twelve will also be seated on your thrones. So Jesus' word to Peter is what? He says, what's in it for us? And Jesus says, guys, there's plenty in it for you. It, you have sacrificed, you have given up. Rest assured, Peter, you're not going to be shortchanged in the kingdom. God's not going to overlook your sacrifice. God is not going to overlook what you have done. He has taken very close notes to what you've given and what you sacrificed, and he's going to, he's going to reward you. In the kingdom, he tells them, the, the disciples, that, that they will not receive less than they deserve. You're going to receive what you deserve, he says. And he says there that there will be the, the, the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes. They're going to become not just receive an inheritance, they receive a royal inheritance, a special place. The book of Revelation, John describes in chapter 4 that around God's throne, there are 24 other thrones seated with 24 elders. No doubt these are 12 of those 24. And he says here that you, the disciples, have this special place, this special authority in the kingdom. By the way, that gives... Some people pause for consideration. They say, but wait a minute, 12 thrones. Is Judas included in this? Because Judas is standing there as he's telling them this. Well, it seems quite clear in Acts that Judas went into his own place, Acts says, and he was replaced by, remember, Matthias. So there's no problem with the 12 here. There were always 12, even after Judas defected. But the 12 will receive those 12 thrones. He assures them, God's not overlooked what you've done. He's going to reward you in, 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 um, in response to your sacrifice. But he doesn't just speak to his 12 disciples. Notice he then speaks to all disciples, verse 29, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. So again, he, he presses the same point. He says that in the kingdom none of us will receive less than we deserve. God knows our deeds. He knows what we've done. He knows our sacrifices, and he has taken note of them, and he will, in fact, reward us accordingly. That's why in Revelation, Jesus himself says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to repay every man according to his deeds. That's why Romans 2 says, There will be tribulation and distress for every soul who does evil, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good. So he reminds us here that God has made note of our sacrifices, and he will, in fact, reward us. We will not go into eternity empty-handed, if you will. He says here that God has prepared wonderful things for those who've sacrificed for him. Every sacrifice made for Jesus' kingdom will be rewarded in Jesus' kingdom. And he tells the disciples, just calm down. You're not going to get left out. God knows what you have done. He will reward you. By the way, I think sometimes with us, we sacrifice, maybe not in the same way the disciples did, and maybe even not as much as others, but we make sacrifices. There are times when many of you, no doubt, you've had those moments when you woke up in the middle of the night burdened for a missionary, burdened for your church, burdened for a friend, and you prayed for them, and nobody ever saw, the church never saw, and your spouse may never saw, but the Lord saw the sacrifice. And he will reward us. 
he says here, if we do so for his name's sake, God is in fact just. He's not going to overlook those who sacrifice much. He says they will receive much. So Peter asked, Lord, what's in it for us? And Jesus says, there's plenty in it for you. God is just. And God will reward you in his way. Now, just as soon as we get to the end of verse 29, we think we got it all figured out. We get to the end of verse 29 and we say, okay, well, that makes perfectly good sense, right? We are reminded here that, that this is, in fact, a performance-based rewards program. You sacrifice much, you will receive much. The disciples gave up everything, they will receive thrones. And so we begin to see that our, he says that he will reward the good that we have done. And then we come to verse 30, and Jesus says something puzzling. But which always introduces a contrast. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Okay, what does that mean? Many who are first will be last, and the last first. I tell my children this is one of those Yoda-like sayings that Jesus has, you know. It's kind of cryptic when you first read it. I can imagine the disciples scratching their head and saying, wait, what? I thought you just told us that the first will be first. You just told us because we've left everything, we will be rewarded. But now you add this little footnote to what you just said, saying, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Which is it? Well, Jesus introduces this little footnote, this little idea. And knowing that they would be puzzled, he then goes on to explain what he means by this footnote. And that's where we have to spill over into chapter 20. This is one of those places where chapter divisions are not as helpful as they should be. In fact, I, I remember reading one time Charles Spurgeon said, um, that he said, I am sorely vexed at the man who chopped the Bible up into chapters. He said, I can't remember his name right now. Truth be told, it's not worth remembering. <laughs> I kind of agree with Spurgeon for this section here because you can't stop with the end of chapter 19. He's going to go on in chapter 20 and then explain what he means. In fact, he ends verse 30. Look, many who are first will be last and the last first. Now go to chapter 20, verse 16, and notice how he concludes. So the last shall be first, and the first last. So do you see what he's done here? He gives this little enigmatic saying here, and he gives it again here, and in the middle he gives this, well, we're going to see parable, to explain what he means. So Jesus has answered Peter's question by saying, listen, Peter, just calm down, understand, in the kingdom of God, none of us will receive less than we deserve. God has made note of that, but... There's more to it than that. You need to understand how the kingdom of God operates. And so he begins with this great parable in verse 1. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. So Jesus is going to give to us a parable. Now, by the way, you remember from Sunday school, a parable is an earthly story that illustrates a heavenly truth. An earthly story. There are all kinds of parables in the Bible about earthly things. Parables about weddings, parables about money, parables about parents, parables about children, all kinds of parables. And here Jesus is going to give one particular parable. It's a parable about this landowner, a parable about this, this man and his employees. Now, I think it's important to point out before we jump into this with two feet, something about this parable. This parable in chapter 20, it is a parable about the workplace. It is not a parable for the workplace. All right? He is going to explain here, note, he is going to explain how the kingdom of God operates. He is not explaining how your business should operate. 
In fact, if you try to operate your business like this, you will probably go bankrupt in six months, all right? He, he, the story here is intended to illustrate a point. And this is where I think we have to be careful and be discerning because you go into the Christian bookstore and you see a book that's like, you know, Jesus' secrets on business management. You say, hey, that looks great. I own a business. I want to learn that. And they'll take parables like this and, and make business principles. And sometimes that's not what the parable's about. The parable is trying to teach a, a, a story and to illustrate something about the kingdom. And so he makes it clear here that this is for the kingdom of heaven is like this scenario. This is not about labor unions, all right? This is a passage about the kingdom. And he's explaining the unique operating of the kingdom. So, what is the kingdom like? It's like this very, very unusual story. Notice how it begins. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. So this guy owns a big farm, a grape farm, if you will. And it is harvest time. It's time to pull all the grapes off to, 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 to fulfill his demand. And so in order to do this, he needs some help. So he goes and he hires a day laborer, some day laborers. I have a pastor friend who lives on one of the border states, uh, Texas or Arizona there. And he says this still happens in his community. You can go to local Home Depot or Lowe's, and there's a group of, you know, just migrant workers who show up early in the morning. And they're waiting for somebody to just pay them for the day's wage, to go put up drywall or to do landscaping. And they come, and this pastor, they go and actually bring donuts and coffee and share the gospel because they're going to be there every day. But he says this still happens. People still show up to just get this day wage. And so th this is how the work was done. So he goes out, and notice he hires them early in the morning. Now, the time we know here is 6 a.m. Before the sun has come up, the day is about to begin, 6 a.m., the first group, he hires them and says, go. Now, notice verse 2. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. So he said, all right, boys, here's the deal. You go work in the field and the vineyard all day long, and I will pay you a denarius. Now, a denarius was basically a, a good day's wage. If we figured it today, just uh, it's difficult to really figure it, but just say minimum wage for, for 12 hours. This is basically a 12-hour shift, about $8 an hour, let's say $9, 12 96 about $100 for a day. Got it? So roughly $100. He said, I'm going to pay you $100 for putting in these 12 hours. They shake on it, they get to work. Then verse 3. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So now what time is it? It's three hours from six, so now it's nine. He goes back to the marketplace and he sees other guys who slept in and missed the alarm clock. He says, all right, guys, what are you doing here? And, and they want to work. And so it says in verse 4, And to those he said, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went. So they hop in the back of his pickup truck. He goes back to the farm. They get out and they go to work. Then verse 5, Again he went out about the sixth hour. So what time is that? That's noon. And then the ninth hour, that's 3 p.m. And he did the same thing. So he's apparently got a huge harvest coming, so he goes at 6 a.m. and hires some workers. He goes at 9, gets some others. He goes at noon, gets some others. Goes back at 3 p.m. and gets some others. Now quitting time is 6. So he hires this, la this group here at 3 p.m. All right? Then you go to verse 6. Just when it couldn't get any more interesting. And about the 11th hour. So what time is that? It's 5 o'clock. There's only an hour left of work, right? And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing around. They, they, I guess they had hangovers or something. Like They completely slept in, and they were out all day. And so they finally show up at 5 o'clock in the evening. He found them standing around. He said, why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, will you go into the vineyard too? So he picks up this last group at 5 p.m. for one hour's work. Other than that being kind of odd, the story is just a normal story of what an employer would do for day laborers. Then it gets interesting. Verse 8. 
When evening came, so six o'clock, quitting time, pay time, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. What? They worked for one hour. And they didn't make $8 for that one hour. They, they got $100, if you will. The full day's wage for one hour of work. So you can imagine what the other guys are thinking, right? They worked one hour and got this. Hey, man, we're in the money, right? Verse 10, when those hired first, so this is the 6 a.m. group. When they came, they thought that they would receive more but each of them also received a denarius. Hmm. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner. That's one of those great Greek verbs. It's, it's an onomatopoeia. You remember a word that sounds like it's meaning? It's, uh, uh, I think it's uh, gugudzo. It's, 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 it's grumbling. It's, it's, these guys are mumbling and murmuring, you know. They're griping with each other. They're going back and forth. What? What is this? He paid them a denarius for, a, for one hour's work and we only got... Come on. So verse 12, they grumble at the landowner saying, these last men have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. Come on, man. We've got the blisters to prove it. We've got the backaches to prove it. We have been here 12 hours all day and you paid those guys who lollygagged in at the last hour the same thing. Now, do you feel sympathetic to their case? We probably all do. We're supposed to feel sympathetic to their case. Because it really doesn't seem fair. But he answered in verse 13 and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? So this guy whips out the contract. See there? You signed it. We agreed to a denarius. By the way, he uses the word friend. That only appears three times in the Gospel of Matthew. And in all three occasions... The person being addressed is in the wrong. It's what Jesus says to Judas in the garden. Friend, do what you have come for. So the man replies, friend, calm down a second. Don't get so upset. I didn't do you any wrong. This is what we agreed for. Verse 14, take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same to you. Is it not lawful, verse 15, for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? There's a great play on words there. It's as if he says, is your eye evil because my hand is good? My hand is good, my hand is generous, and that makes your eye evil? He says here, is it not lawful for me to do what I want with what I own? This is my land. These are my money. These are my crops. These are my employees. I can pay them whatever I want. And then Jesus concludes verse 16 again. So the last shall be first and the first last. So what does that mean? Well, remember what Jesus says at the beginning. This is not about business. This is about what? It's about the kingdom. He says this is how the kingdom operates. So Jesus has already explained to Peter 
part one of this. Peter says, Lord, what's in it for us? And Jesus says, hey, don't worry about it. Don't, don't get all upset. Rest assured, God knows your sacrifice. He knows what you have done in the kingdom. None of us, none of you will receive less than you deserve. But many of us will receive more than we deserve. Isn't that where the parable ends? He says, listen guys, God knows what you have done. He's going to reward you according to your deeds. Don't fret that. Don't worry about that. But understand how the kingdom operates. You will not receive one reward less than what you deserve. But there's going to be others there who are going to receive a lot more than what they deserve. Because that's how God operates in his kingdom. We say, well, that's not fair. God is not too interested in our definition of fair. Because God's kingdom operates not only by the fact that God is just, it also operates by an understanding that God is gracious. That God is generous. That God is benevolent. So we say, well, what does this parable mean? What this parable means is that for, for, for some of us, you came to faith in Christ when you were young. You were six, seven, eight years old. You were raised in a Christian home. You, you went to VBS and Sunday school and you read your Bible. You memorized the verses. You did everything you were supposed to, the devotions and the children's choir. You grew up and were in the youth choir, went to youth camp. You helped serve. You went to all the revival meetings and to all the special camps. You did all these things and now you're older and you're growing in your knowledge. You're serving serving on committees, you're helping in the nursery, you've lived your entire life in the hot, scorching sun, carrying the burden of this work. You've plowed long days in the fields of prayer. You've scattered the seeds of the gospel for a long time. You have diligently pulled up the weeds of sin in your own life. And for your whole life, you have done this. And then somebody else comes along who has wasted their time, who squandered their day, and they have come along, and at the very end of their life, they come into the kingdom. And the temptation for us would be to say, that's not fair. Look what I have done. I have worked all day long. You see, this parable is a wonderful litmus test for self-righteousness. If you want to figure out whether or not your heart is self-righteous and you have some Pharisee tendencies in you, just apply this. Because we look at what we have done thinking, well, we deserve, in, we deserve eternal life. Come on, we have done it. This guy wastes his whole life and he also gets eternal life? And Jesus says, yes. Why? Not because God is is. is, is condoning of the guy's squandering of his time, but because God is just that merciful. God is that gracious and that generous towards sinners. You see, the, 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 the quintessential example of this parable is what we read earlier, the thief on the cross. Here is a man who spent his whole life in sin, in rebellion, in thievery, and who knows what else, and with his dying breath he enters the kingdom not at 5 p.m it's 5 59 and 59 seconds and the guy with his chest heaving up and down with his final words with the pain in his arms with death just moments away he says jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom and jesus said today you will be with me why because god is merciful to the end God is gracious to the very end. And in the kingdom, none of us will receive less than we deserve. But let's be honest, many will receive far more than what we deserve. Because God is that gracious and that generous. And so we find ourselves evaluating our own hearts 
Do we operate by a sense of our own sense of fairness or do we operate by an understanding of how God's kingdom works and how God's grace is extended? By the way, friends, a wonderful application to this. If you have loved ones who are not Christians, do not stop praying for them. Pray, pray, pray for their conversion to the very, very end because God is gracious to the very, very end. He gives the full reward. Whether you started working at 6 a.m. and you've worked your whole life or you come in at the last minute, he rewards those who follow him. He rewards them with the denarius, if you will, of eternal life. And he is gracious and he is kind. In the magical story of Alice in Wonderland, There's a scene where Alice and her friends come across some birds who have just gotten out of some water and they're all wet. And the birds are discussing how they can get dry and so the dodo bird comes along and the dodo bird proposes a race. And they say, what do you mean? He says, we should have a caucus race is what he calls it. He says, what is that? So the dodo bird being quite odd He tells them that he's going to organize the race. Well, it's a bizarre race because there's no starting line. There's no finish line. There's no indication of when to begin, and the course is really poorly marked. And so all of a sudden, they just sort of, whenever they want, they start running around, and they sort of run all over the place, and for about half an hour, they run around. With little rhyme, little reason, they're kind of all over the place. And after about 30 minutes, the dodo bird says, the race is over. And there are birds kind of just scattered all over the place. And so they all come near and they say, well, who won the race? And the dodo bird sat there for a second, thought, and the dodo bird replied, everybody is one. And so everyone must receive the prize. That's how the kingdom works. My friend, if you follow Christ, we all win. Whether you started at 6 a.m. or you come in at 559, we all win. And we all receive the prize. Because yes, God is very, very just. And he rewards us according to our deeds. But it is also true that God is incredibly gracious. And merciful. And my friend, if you don't know Christ here this morning, I invite you today is your opportunity to repent and to trust Him, to turn from your sins and turn to Jesus, knowing that Jesus Christ is better and more valuable than anything that you give up in this world. He is a better treasure and He will not disappoint. And I invite you to repent of your sins and trust Him today. And he has promised in his grace and his mercy to save us and to invite us not only as laborers in his kingdom but adopt us as children. And we become co-heirs with Christ and what he's done. You see, in the kingdom, none of us will receive less than we deserve. That's a fact. But many will receive far more than they deserve. Because our God is a gracious and merciful God. So let's give him thanks for it. Father, we thank you for this parable from the lips of Jesus. Lord, we admittedly wrestle with issues of grace. We admittedly wrestle with your mercy sometimes. And Father, we believe that you are indeed just. But we also know that you are good and gracious. And Father, this morning I know that in this room there are names and faces that are heavy upon our heart of friends and loved ones, parents, grandparents who have not trusted Christ. And we pray for them, Lord, that they would be converted. Even if it be upon their deathbed, we pray that they would trust Jesus and know your mercy with their final breath. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we might find ourselves like Peter and disciples, to be diligent, 
to give up what we have for the sake of your kingdom, knowing that you will reward us many times over for what we have done and sacrificed. Father, may we press on in faithfulness each and every day for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.